Well, this is the third woe or the seventh trumpet. Now, when you remember how Revelation is being unfolded, you remember that it's a seven sealed scroll that's being unraveled. The ceiling is on the top. You break one and you can unravel a little bit more. The last one, the seventh seal, is composed of seven trumpet messages within the seventh seal. When you get to the seventh trumpet, you are at the middle of the tribulation period. And the seventh trumpet literally blows over the last three and a half years. And in that trumpet message, you have an amazing um, potpourri of things that the Bible speaks about in terms of judgment, including the seven last plagues, including Armageddon. It's an amazing prophecy. And the key is right here at verse 15. Apparently at the middle of the week, the Lord God takes over in a way that is a more, um, let's say his immediate involvement in the affairs and events. God certainly is sovereign and he is controlling the affairs and events in his world. But he is going to take over, literally, and bring his vengeance and wrath upon the world that has been long predicted by the Hebrew prophets of old. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Now, the very word kingdom uh, presents a lot of problems to Christians. Uh, there are theological systems today called uh, kingdom now or dominion theology, which means that we can kind of take over and set up the kingdom of God on earth now through the work of the gospel. They speak of the triumph of the gospel in this present age and how we are going to become more of a Christianized, uh, governed world, that somehow we're going to fulfill all the dimensions of the thousand-year reign of Christ by Christians having victory over all the nations of the world. Well, I've heard that and heard that, but I don't believe it. The Bible says that evil is going to get worse Wicked men are going to wax worse and worse. The deception is going to grow. And the love of the majority is going to uh, be very cold and indifferent. And Jesus predicted a terrible, terrible time. No, we're not taking over. Uh, we're trying to take as many men and women and boys and girls to heaven with us as we possibly can. But I'll tell you, most of the world is going rapidly uh, towards um, the Antichrist and the world system the Bible speaks about. Uh, we're more secular today than we've ever been. Uh, we are further away from God and His truth than we have ever been. And people are really in desperate need of a moral and spiritual revival in this country. I hope you understand that. And if we don't have one, I don't give much hope to this country. I think we're going to go down the tubes. And I think God's either going to judge us or we, in fact, may be the nation that will produce the Antichrist. But that will come more in our study. And I will stir up your fertile minds to great controversy when we come to that. But to show you how important the word kingdom is, uh, the word kingdom in its forms is mentioned 562 times in the Bible. This is not a small subject. The kingdom of God is mentioned 69 times and all in the New Testament. The kingdom of heaven, very interesting term, uh, is used 32 times in the New Testament and all of them are in the Gospel of Matthew. We often speak about Matthew presenting Jesus as the king. And the reason for that is because of the usage of the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord Jesus, when he tells us parables, they are usually parables of the kingdom. If you notice that carefully, if you study Matthew chapter 13, for instance, you will see a number of parables all dealing with understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Now, there's a sense in which uh, God is ruling over everything, and the Bible makes that clear. I want you to look, first of all, at the extent of his kingdom. Verse 15 says that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Now, some of you have a singular kingdom. But the King James text, the Textus Receptus, that which was received and used by the King James scholars, and they had the majority of manuscripts available, uh, it reads plural kingdoms. And I think it's more proper. What he's talking about is all the the kingdoms of the world. Not, there's not just one, but all of them are going to become one under the headship of the Lord and his Messiah. Uh, I would look at the extent of the kingdom in two ways. First of all, in terms of time. It says at the end of verse 15, he shall reign forever and ever. Aren't you glad of that? 
Hey, when the Lord takes over, nobody's going to push him off the throne. He's going to rule forever and ever. Some people say, well, he's only going to rule for a thousand years. Not so. In, in the passages in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, dealing with the coming kingdom of God on earth, it always speaks of it as being eternal. There will be what we call the mediatorial kingdom, that is the manifestation of the rule of Christ under specific regulations and conditions during the thousand-year reign, but that will not stop or end the continual kingdom of our Lord, where he's going to reign forever and ever. There will be no end. We read in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government, the one coming, will be on his shoulder. He will need no one else to bear it. Uh, the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end on the throne of David to establish it with justice forevermore, and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What's the extent of the coming kingdom of our Lord? As to time, he shall reign forever and ever. Turn to Psalm 93. Psalm 93. There is no greater joy than to talk about how the Lord's going to take over. When you see what's happening, when you see what our leaders are doing, uh, nothing thrills the heart of the believer anymore than to realize the Lord is going to take over. The Lord's going to be king. He'll reign forever and ever. In Psalm 93, verse 1 and 2, it says, The Lord reigneth. He is presently reigning. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also established, that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Turn to Psalm 145. In terms of time, he will reign forever and ever. Psalm 145. Look at verses 10 to 13. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. According to the Bible, it's everlasting. Turn to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. The Bible is replete with evidence telling us that the kingdom of God will never end. The reign of the Messiah will be forever and ever. In Daniel chapter 4, in verse 3, How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Look at chapter 6 of Daniel, verse 26. Chapter 6, verse 26 of Daniel. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, this is King Darius, Men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. Look at chapter 7, verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom unto the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Turn to 2 Peter in the New Testament, chapter 1. 2 Peter, chapter 1, and look at verse 11. The Bible speaks of the eternal, everlasting kingdom and dominion of our Lord over everything. He will reign forever and ever. In 2 Peter 1, verse 11, I like this. After telling us to make sure of our calling and election, if you do these things, you shall never fall. It says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The New Testament also refers to the kingdom as being everlasting. But not only in terms of time, in terms of territory. Uh, Revelation 11.15 says, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. 
And the Bible makes that clear. Turn to Psalm 47. Psalm 47. In terms of territory, we see the extent of the kingdom of God, as well as in terms of time. In, in Psalm 47, verse 7 and 8, it says, For God is the king of all the earth. Not Clinton. <laughs> not Yeltsin. Not anyone but the Lord. God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen or nations. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. In Psalm 103:19, it says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. He's going to rule over the entire earth. And by the way, he's going to rule from Jerusalem. It's going to be a restructured, redesigned, brand new Jerusalem that will be elevated above the whole world. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And he's going to rule over everything, over the whole world. He'll make all decisions. Can you believe it? There'll be no cabinet. Is that great or what? There'll be no Supreme Court. Amen? Lawyers will be out of business. Praise God. Doctors will be out of business. Amen. Preachers will be out. No, wait. The Lord will be king over everything, and he'll rule and reign forever and ever. But go back to Revelation 11. You look at the extent of his kingdom, but in verses 16 to 19, we have the exaltation of his majesty and coming kingdom. It's time to exalt the Lord. It's time to praise him. Remember that the early church said that Revelation was the worship book. Israel said Psalms is the worship book. But the early church said Revelation is the worship book of the New Testament and of the people of God. And you can see why in passages like this. The exaltation of his majesty and coming kingdom, verses 16 to 19. I want you to notice several things. Look at the immediate reaction of the 24 elders in verse 16. What do they do? The Bible says upon hearing that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, it says the four and twenty elders who sat before God on their seats or thrones fell upon their faces and worshiped God. That's what it says. Interesting, isn't it? What are you feeling right now? The immediate reaction of the 24 elders. Took, turn back to chapter 4. This has been a frequent theme in Revelation about the 24 elders who we believe represents the completed church in heaven while the tribulation is going on on earth. In Revelation 4, verse 10, it says, The four and twenty elders fell down before him that is seated on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Look at chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book or scroll, the four beasts or living creatures, and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. It's a common theme. Look at verse 14. The four living creatures said, Amen. Literally, they kept saying, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Uh, turn over to chapter 19, verse 4. Even beyond where we are now in the text, we read again of them. As seen as in heaven, chapter 19, right before the return of Christ and power and great glory at the end of the tribulation, it says, The four and twenty elders... And the four beasts or living creatures fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah, or praise the Lord. What are you saying? The immediate reaction of the 24 elders. Sing with me. Thou art worthy, 
Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created, hast all things created, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are created, for Thou art worthy, O Lord. And all God's people said, and the next word is hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's do it again. All God's people said, Amen, Amen. and hallelujah. hallelujah. To who? To our God. The exaltation of His majesty and coming kingdom. The reaction, immediate reaction of the 24 elders tells us what to do. I would have to say also a second thing is the continual response of the 24 elders mentioned uh, in the words that follow. Look at that carefully. In verse 17, here's what they said. We give thanks, literally we continue to give thanks. We constantly give thanks. O Lord God Almighty. Flip back to Revelation 1. Verse 8. Jesus is quoted. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the what? The Almighty. Back to Revelation 11. We give you continual thanks, O Lord God Almighty. Look over to chapter 19, verse 6. Chapter 19, verse 6. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of mighty thunderings or peals of thunder, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent, almighty, reigneth. The praise to God. The continual response of the 24 elders giving thanks, O Lord God Almighty, who art and wast and art to come, the eternal God, constantly giving him thanks. You know, the Bible says when you're filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18 to 20, you will be giving thanks continually to God for everything. It's a, quite a rebuke to us, isn't it? When we say we're filled with the Spirit and we don't constantly thank God for everything that happens, it's amazing. I uh, locked my keys in my car tonight. I know. And there was not an outburst of praise out of my mouth. <laughs> While I'm standing trying to figure out what to do, this fellow comes over and says, you locked your keys in your car, huh? You know, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? I said, yeah, right, I locked my keys. I said, you got something to help me? He said, no. <laughs> he says, no, I don't. So I kind of ignored it. He just kept talking to me. He said, I want to give you my card. He, sold, he says, you might need some electronic products, and here's my card. You know, I'm trying to get my car door open. <laughs> well, you might need some electronic products sometime. I said, okay. He said, boy, your voice sure sounds familiar. <laughs> I said, really? He says, yeah. He said, I think I heard you on the radio last night. <laughs> no. What's your name? I said, David Hawking. Why? That's the guy I heard last night on the radio. <laughs> you cannot believe how my act was cleaned up. <laughs> oh, how I praise the Lord. Oh, how I thank you, God, for this precious moment of time. You know, often we get rebuked, don't we? God says in everything give thanks, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, for this is the will of God, yet... 
I do not find that coming out of my heart all the time, do you? And yet that is, according to the Bible, the continual response. You say, well, they're in heaven. Maybe I'll do that when I get to heaven. Well, turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Folks, this is what God wants of us now. He wants us to thank him. And a lot of things in life are difficult to thank God for. There's a lot of hurts and a lot of trouble and a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty. I know that and you know that. In Hebrews chapter 13, though, we see a very clear message from the Lord. In verse 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but to do good and to communicate or to share, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. You say, I want to please God in my life. Great. And this is the way we do it. We offer the sacrifice of praise, constantly giving thanks to the Lord for all that he is doing. I don't understand it all, and it all doesn't seem good to me, but the Bible says all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. The continual response of the 24 elders in heaven is a reminder to us that when God says the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdom of his Lord and of his Christ, then I have my motive for praising him, my motive for thanking him, because he's in control. No one else is. He is. And he's one day, one day going to show it in a dramatic fashion like the world has never seen. Back to Revelation 11 again. And in verse 17 and 18, we find the basic reasons for this outburst of praise to the Lord. And we need to see it very clearly that we might have hearts filled with thanksgiving and praise to him. There are four basic reasons listed here for praise. And I know sometimes we're not motivated to praise the Lord uh, when we're hurting and pain is deep and we're suffering personally. Our hearts are not filled with praise. I think it's so important when we gather together to praise the Lord. Uh, it's so important to sing songs of praise to him that focus on God. Songs whose central purpose is nothing else than to say he deserves all the glory. He deserves all the praise. We need to get our eyes off of ourselves and the difficulties that we go through. And we need to focus on him. To praise the Lord. Every day I will bless thee. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The Bible says from the rising of the sun till it's going down, let the name of the Lord be praised. Just constantly thanking the Lord for all that he's doing. Even that which we don't understand. Even that which we can't seem to cope with. God is working his wonderful plan out, and we can thank him and we can praise him. And these reasons really bless me. I hope they will your heart as well. The first reason for praise is God's power. God's power is being proclaimed. Notice carefully what it says in verse 17. Because, right in the middle of the verse, because. Why did they constantly give thanks to the Lord? Because, here's the first reason, thou hast taken to thee thy great power, and hast reigned. There's no other reason to praise the Lord as powerful as that one. It's God's power. You have taken your great power, and you have reigned. You have taken over. You are in charge. I praise you, Lord, for your power. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. His power is not limited. God can do anything, and we need to trust him. And sometimes we ask like Abraham, uh, Lord, have you looked at Sarah lately? <laughs> and maybe we ask like, Sarah, have you seen Abraham? <laughs> but again, the Bible says in Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing's too hard for him. <laughs> he who made the worlds and flung them into existence in six 24-hour days, I gave you my view there, but he who did that, do you think he might be able to handle our problems? What concerns you today? God's power is a reason for praise. Number two is God's plan. 
His plan is being accomplished. And look at this carefully. The nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. How interesting. It looks like wickedness is prevailing. It looks like everything is falling apart. Yet one of the reasons they praise the Lord is in spite of the angry nations, the wrath of God is come. And, and dear believers, be encouraged. The world's not getting away with what you think they're getting away with. God's wrath is coming, and he's going to unleash it in the tribulation period. And the dead are going to be judged. God's going to take care of it. Turn to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. A wonderful messianic psalm, meaning its focus is primarily the Messiah and his coming reign and victory. But you see here why they were praising the Lord and thanking him. Because it says the nations are angry. I mean, it, they're hostile. They're violent. The whole place looks like it's falling apart. It's in the hands of the enemy. And yet they're praising the Lord. They say, uh-uh. No, God's plan's being accomplished. His wrath is going to come on them all. And Psalm 2 has a similar message. Listen to these words. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen or the nations rage? The peoples imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let's get rid of all that messianic talk and those Christians. Verse 4, He who sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure, his great displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's fulfilled in Revelation 11, 15 to 19. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. Then he goes on to explain what he's going to do. In spite of the angry nations around us and all of their plots and plans to defeat Christianity and to turn their backs on the Messiah, yet it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they who put their trust in him. Isn't that a powerful psalm? It really matches what we're reading. Back to Revelation 11 and verse 18. The nations were angry, all right, but the wrath of God has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. God's taking over and they are praising the Lord not only for his power, but also for his plan being accomplished. The third thing they praise God for is his promise that's going to be fulfilled to the believer. God's wonderful promises are yea and nay, the Bible says. You can depend on his word. They're going to come to pass. The Lord is faithful. Faithful is he who has called us, who will also perform it and do it. We can trust the Lord. Look at what it says in the middle of verse 18. And that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints... And them that fear thy name, small and great. God's no respecter of persons. Every now and then when somebody has done something that seems to be out of the ordinary, we often say, well, you must, gonna, you must gonna really be, have a great reward someday. I think we're all going to be amazed when we get to glory and see how he rewards. Now, I don't claim to know, and I don't claim to be... Uh, you know, trying to put it together and conjecture about it or give you my opinion as opposed to others, I just simply bring before you the evidence of the Scripture. First of all, the Bible's clear that every one of us will receive a reward. I think that's good news. Some of you probably sitting here wonder if you've ever done anything for God. You know what I mean? You sometimes get so discouraged and you say, I, I don't know what I've ever done for the Lord. Well, the good news is every believer will be rewarded. We're also going to be rewarded 
according to what God has given to us in the way of ability and talent, not according to what someone else has in the way of responsibility. Isn't that interesting? See, God's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't look at you and say, well, John, you're not really as faithful as Tom is. Tom's, uh, you know, he's uh, done a thousand things compared to your ten. No, God's going to judge you on the basis of your opportunities, your abilities, your talents, and your service for him. He is not going to judge you in relationship to anybody else. And to me, that's kind of amusing as well as encouraging, but it's amusing to me because that's usually how we evaluate each other. We're usually always comparing ourselves with someone else or what they did or they said or they can do or not do, and God's not going to judge that way at all. Another interesting thing is that God, according to the Bible, is going to judge according to the truth what actually was done. Who knows that all those things we think were so great were not anything but wood, hay, and stubble. God knows whether what you have done is real. And the other thing I've noticed in the Bible is that the littlest things are mentioned by God. You know, you'd think that if you were talking about reward, God would say, those who have uh, held a harvest crusade and reached 50,000 people in three days will be at the front of the line at the judgment seat of Christ. No, he doesn't say that. And to whom much is given, much is required. He doesn't say that at all. God uses the most interesting illustrations. He says about being faithful in a few things. Uh, he talks about every cup of cold water given in his name will receive a reward. He said, the Lord is righteous who will never forget your work and your labor of love. You know, no one else may have seen it. No one else may have appreciated it. But you did it as unto the Lord. And it meant something to you. And, and maybe it wasn't significant in the eyes of others. But it sure was to you. And your heart was toward the Lord in it. Well, let me tell you, dear friends, God saw it. And he will never forget. God's going to reward you. Aren't you glad of that? And one person said to me recently, well, they're just going to be crowns and we're going to throw them at his feet. So what good is that? But, you, know. <laughs> you know, and I can appreciate that. You know, I, I know sometimes this gets a little confusing. But let me remind you that Jesus even said that during the reign of the Messiah on earth, his kingdom, that actually we're going to be busy serving the Lord and having positions over lots of people that are going to be born during the millennium. Yes, they're going to be unbelievers during the thousand-year reign of Christ. And we who are believers are going to be in resurrected bodies and are going to be ruling and reigning. And some of us, some of us according to the Bible, will be reigning over several cities at once. Incredible. Won't it be interesting? Some of you are already thinking. If you'll be reigning over your present employer. <laughs> no, but anyway... <laughs> You know, just, just a thought, just a thought, passing thought. You know, don't dwell on it too much. Okay. But God's promises are wonderful. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. If there were, ever was a reason for all of us just to shout praise to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you. He is a righteous judge. He's no respecter of persons. He doesn't lay a heavy trip on us. He counts every little thing, no matter what it is. He'll never forget your labor of love. He'll reward you. He even says in Revelation 22, I come quickly and my reward is with me. He wants to reward you. He wants to honor you. Can you believe it? Our blessed Lord who's done so much for us. Hey, the reward will just be in glory. Just being there and being with the Lord. But to think that he then wants to reward you for all that you've done in his name here. Really exciting. In Matthew 25, we read in verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Same thing in verse 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. Even though they had different uh, opportunities and abilities and, and expressions of that, one five talents, one two, yet it says the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee real ruler over many things. It just struck me that God did not say, be faithful over many things, and I'll make thee a ruler over a few. Now, frankly, that's what I would think we would deserve. 
And even then, I'm not sure we deserve any reward. But I could understand that. But imagine the Lord would reverse that and say, you just be faithful in a few little things, and I'm going to make you a ruler over many. You will not believe what I'm going to do for you. You know, folks, I sometimes need to hear that more than anything else when life is such a bummer. How about you? I need to understand the glorious future that awaits us. In 1 Corinthians, we read, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has prepared for those who love him. Can you, can you believe it? What we're going to be blessed with, as God says, I have loved you, I've delighted in you, I will honor you, I will reward you. Imagine the Lord doing that for us when he has done so much for us. In other words, his kindness to us in Christ and salvation is not going to end. According to the Bible in Ephesians 2, his kindness is going to continually be outpoured upon us in all the ages to come. What a blessing that's going to be. Now look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. You talk about blessing. Oh, Peter always putting his foot in his mouth, but he came to him and said, Lo, we've left all and have followed thee. Don't you love it? <laughs> and there, there are people just like Peter around right now. You cannot believe what I gave up to serve the Lord. We've left all and followed thee. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands um, with persecutions. And in the age to come, what? Eternal life. Many that are first should be last, the last first. Hey, God's system of reckoning is different, but God definitely is going to bless us far more than we deserve. That's what the Bible says. It's going to be a hundredfold, not just equal distribution, but he's going to bless you far more than you will be able to contain it. I like to say that God blesses in spite of us and not because of us. But God does bless abundantly in even rewarding what we have done in his name. Turn back to Revelation 11. We said there are four reasons for this outburst of praise. One is that God's power is being proclaimed. Two is that God's plan is being accomplished. Three is that God's promise is being fulfilled. And number four, they praise him for an interesting fact, and that's God's punishment of the wicked. God's punishment is declared here. Look at the uh, end of that verse, 18. And shouldst destroy them who destroy the earth. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. To the believer that endures the wickedness of this generation and the terrible factors of, of political and uh, civil corruption and control, to the believers who have endured persecution, torture, suffering in the name of the Lord, there is a flicker of hope. I know it sounds strange, but there is a promise from God that he is going to avenge all of those who have suffered for him. He's going to destroy those who have destroyed. In 2 Thessalonians 1, we read in verse 8, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. How interesting. When is he going to do it? When he comes to be glorified in us and admired among all who believe, that's when he's going to punish also with everlasting destruction those who have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that none of you here will be a part of that, that you all come to know the Lord. Turn to Revelation chapter 11 again in verse 19. We have noticed a few things about the exaltation of his majesty and coming kingdom. We notice the immediate reaction of the 24 elders as they fell upon their faces and worshiped God. We notice their continual response in heaven to constantly give 
thanks to God. We saw the basic reasons for that outburst of praise to the Lord God Almighty, his power and plan and promise and punishment. But one final thing, look at the glorious revelation in heaven that is given to us in verse 19. What a blessed thing. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament or covenant. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great ha hail. A very dramatic response. In fact, flip back to chapter 4 and look at verse 5. Remember the scene in heaven at the throne of God? It says, out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices and lamps of fire burning. There's a dramatic scene when you look at the presence of the Lord. Uh, in chapter 8, verse 5, the scene also in heaven from the altar, uh, prayers of the saints ascending to God and God's answer coming. And it says in verse 5, that when they cast this to the earth, there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Again, the dramatic response to what God is doing. Um, chapter 16, verse 18, looking at the seven last plagues. When the seventh one uh, is done, it says there are voices and thunders and lightnings and a great earthquake, such as would not since men were on the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. So God literally shakes the place and thunders forth with his voice, and lightning shoot out, and it's an amazing display of the glory and majesty of God. And God is literally proclaiming his glory and showing how insignificant planet Earth really is. The revelation in heaven has a special blessing to all believers. I hope you didn't miss it. God's temple in heaven, the dwelling place of the Lord, in the third heaven is opened, and what do we see but the Ark of the Covenant? Now, are we talking about the box they had years ago that Harrison Ford went after? <laughs> um, I don't think so. <laughs> I like what one rabbi said. He's kind of messianic. It was quoted in the paper when they were talking about when they brought the uh, Ethiopian Jews up on Operation Solomon. Uh, many people believe that the ark was down there, hidden by them. And he said, I don't care. He said, I'm not looking for the box. I'm looking for the one who told us to make the box. <laughs> I like that, don't you? Isn't that good? What do we see in heaven? We see the Ark of the Covenant. Now, why was that shown here right now? It's the Ark of the what? The Covenant. You see, God has made a promise, and he's never going to go back on it. God is going to fulfill his word. And out of the loins of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and King David and Solomon, is going to come he who shall rule my people, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's going to take over. And the Ark of the Covenant is a reminder to them of God's promise. He's going to fulfill his word. He's going to do what he said, and you can trust him. Many people in speaking of this say that this is a great testimony to the faithfulness of God. That Ark of the Covenant represented the faithfulness of God to his people. You can count on God to do what he said. And when heaven is opened after this brilliant, spectacular display of the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, at that moment, God opens heaven, and there it is, the Ark of the Covenant. He's a faithful God. Turn to Psalm 89, and we're through. Psalm 89. God is a faithful God. You can trust him to do what he said. Psalm 89. Verse 1 and 2, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. Verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round 
about thee. Verse 24, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. Verse 33, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer or allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor will I alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. Yes, God, let them see the Ark of the Covenant to remind them of his faithfulness. It will never fail. His loving kindness will never be taken from them. God will keep his word. And that's what Revelation is all about. Be faithful, weary pilgrims. One day the Lord's going to come. And we shall see him. And we will rejoice as we have never rejoiced before. With joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you are in charge, that the Lord God reigns. You put up kings and set them down, and all the nations of the world can be angry and hostile and scream and yell at you. But you sit in the heavens and laugh. You'll have them in derision. They'll be so mixed up, they won't know what to do. And you, Lord, will prepare the hearts of all men to receive the only one who deserves to be king of kings and lord of lords. And every kingdom and every nation of the world will come under his power and control. And righteousness will be on this planet finally and forever. The righteous branch will rule and reign, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I do not know the hearts of these people, but you do. And you know the ones who've come into the meeting that have not yet bowed the knee to the king, who are still trying to run their own life, who still think they're in charge. God, I pray that you'd teach us to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, knowing that he will lift us up. To draw near to God, he will draw near to us. God, I pray that those in our audience who are not sure of their own relationship with Jesus Christ might right now in this moment bow the knee to him, and confess him to be Lord of their life. To your honor and to your glory. And I pray for believers who may be deep in sinful actions and attitudes. It is so easy for the enemy to sow the seeds of decay and deterioration and despair. It is so easy for our own depravity to go unchecked. It is so easy for us to allow the circumstances and events of life to overwhelm us to the point there seems to be no hope and no possibility of change. God, I thank you that you're the living God who can do great and mighty things, and you can change things. God, help us to turn to the only one who can do anything about our problems. And I pray for those that are wrestling with sinful matters. God, help us to remember your cleansing through our Lord Jesus Christ, your strength and your power. May we depend upon you, Lord, and you alone. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.